Tetris. What exactly is Puyo Puyo Tetris? Would you enjoy it? And what about the game makes it so unique? There are so many aspects of design that it handles well. The campaign alone, though, makes the game worth looking at. So today, I'd like to break down the concepts that leave such a lasting impression. It so turns out that any game, regardless of concept, can have excellent mission design if developers follow a few key guidelines. My name is Resonance22. And in this retrospective, I'll be taking a close look at the game design, behind the campaign, and Puyo Puyo Tetris. Puyo Puyo Tetris is certainly an unassuming game, to say the least. When it was first released in the West back in 2017, I initially dismissed it as I had so many great titles competing for my attention. Little did I know, when I finally picked it up near the end of the year, I just couldn't stop playing. It quickly became my most played game on the Switch, and for now, it somehow still holds that title, barely hovering above Wargroove and even Smash Ultimate, two games that I absolutely adore. I can see it. It's coming. Horror. What's equally impressive is that I actually took the time to get 130% in the campaign despite its brutal difficulty. I'd like to examine the core gameplay loop in another retrospective, so let me know if you'd be interested. But first, let's talk about the campaign. After all, it's the campaign that initially got me hooked. Puyo Puyo Tetris is a crossover puzzle game featuring both Tetris and Puyo Puyo, two different tile-matching puzzle games. In a nutshell, Tetris is about the satisfying gameplay loop of fitting inconvenient pieces together in a row to clear the line. Puyo Puyo involves players fitting four or more of the same color piece together to clear them. Since the titular Puyos fall down after pieces are cleared, they can then create satisfying chain combos if a new color match is formed. This may sound familiar, and that's because if, like me, you played games like Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine and Kirby's Avalanche, those are actually just reskinned localized Puyo Puyo games. The Puyo series is tremendously popular in Japan, as both a casual and esports title, and it's a masterpiece of puzzle design. Puyo Puyo Tetris may be your first introduction and it's my hope that SEGA localizes more of the series after the success of this one. The idea of combining both Puyo Puyo and Tetris may sound bizarre, and it is, but the idea is actually brilliant due to the convenient overlap of a few core mechanics. First off, the objective of each game is to defeat your opponent by filling their screen with blocks. Some modern Tetris games, like Tetris 99, prominently feature a versus mode, where clearing several lines either in a row or simultaneously will send your opponent garbage blocks that push their stack upward toward the ceiling. There's always a gap in the garbage though, so players can clear them, but if your stack hits the ceiling, then it's game over. Puyo Puyo operates on a similar idea, but in reverse, where clearing more than four pieces at the same time, or through a chain, will cause garbage blocks to drop on top of the opponent's stack. When the screen is filled to the point that the red X is blocked, then that player is then defeated. The crossover works particularly well because both games also have a reasonably similar user interface, with a tall rectangle representing the player area and a preview window for upcoming pieces. Before I talk about the single player, I think it's worth mentioning just how detailed and charming the character animations are. Together with the voice lines that you heard earlier, it makes every scene, every match, and every combo memorable. The music also does a great job setting the mood for each scene and battle. Now, the campaign hooked me in three ways. The first was through its plot. It's as ridiculous as I'd expect a game called Puyo Puyo Tetris to be, but what makes it particularly good is how it's self-aware. It centers around two different universes, one for Tetris and one for Puyo, each equipped with their own set of characters. The two dimensions end up merging together for reasons that they explain later, and everyone finds common ground, and that they each settle their differences with puzzle battles. At no point is it really explained why people battle in puzzle games, and how it's physically happening in the game world, and the way the writing is, it's so much better that way. The characters reference this all the time, and it's mostly a cathartic thing for them. The plot is actually less about the battles, which is good, and more about individual character development, if you make the battles have far too much relevance to the plot, you end up with the bizarre world of Yu-Gi-Oh, a show that walks the line between absurd 
and a work of art. Anyway, about the characters. They have some incredibly deep themes, and the subjects that they discuss, which I can't spoil, are pretty refreshing for a game to address. I was shocked, and still am, that a puzzle game could make me feel for the characters. Around chapters 7 and 10, there are some pretty heavy undertones, but they thankfully never eclipse the generally lighthearted nature of the game. This is balanced out by perhaps the best campaign, Chapter 9, which I'd love to do a let's play of. The dialogue in there is absolutely brilliant, and you can see a snippet of it here. Stand still while I examine. This guy's rubbing me the wrong way. I would never rub you the wrong way! The writing is surprisingly good, and each of the characters are super endearing. I don't normally play this type of game. Alright, I sometimes play this type of game, but I can see why some folks might not. Compared to the usual fare, Pui Puyo Tetris has some seriously clever dialogue, fantastic voice acting, and memorable character design across the board. Perhaps one of my bigger mistakes is not taking a Tetris game with characters seriously, as they really do add to the experience. They add variety and personality to the game without compromising its competitive integrity. Each character has such a unique design, so it's a cool way for players to express themselves. The second way that it hooked me was through its overall structure. Every AI has a distinct strategy, each challenge tests a different skill, characters get a good distribution of spotlight, and new modes are introduced at just the right rate to always keep it interesting. The third way was the careful balance of difficulty and challenge, which ties right into its organization. While most of the gameplay here is a mix of later playthroughs, when I was first starting out, the difficulty was actually perfect. I hadn't played Tetris in a few years, and I certainly wasn't good at it, or at least I thought I was good until I played this game, and I hadn't played Puyo since I think 2004, back when Puyo Pop Fever was released. The game is incredibly well structured in this regard, while still offering a suitable challenge for veterans. So how does it achieve this, and what can we learn about its design? One thing we can learn about its design is how effectively the game utilizes its soundtrack. Every track is extremely catchy, sets the tone, helps players focus, fits the style of the game, and there's plenty of variety here, with throwbacks to Puyo classics. For example, this next song does a great job of conveying that the first few matches are just a friendly skirmish. The first level is a simple versus match, where you play Tetris against a very slow Puyo AI. This is important because players are more likely to have a base familiarity with Tetris, so I think starting the player off in that mode is a nice touch. However, the first two opponents play Puyo, so the players can get some exposure to the game mode, and how the two match up, mechanically. Interspersed throughout these versus matches are several single-player marathon modes, where players must fulfill a certain condition. For example, one level has players clear X amount of lines in a strict time limit, teaching speed and downstacking techniques. Another level may require a specific score threshold, encouraging players to learn the value of Tetrises, T-spin combos, and powerful attacks. After four rousing games of Tetris, two against the AI, and two against the deadliest enemy of them all, yourself, the game pits you against I, the ship's engineer. It's time for Tetris vs. Tetris, the moment that you've been training for. The fifth level in Chapter 1 is probably the first time that you can lose, and it's a valuable opportunity for players to apply what they just learned in the previous four levels. I might be easy for me now, but for a new player, he can be surprisingly challenging. The very slight speed increase and subtle behavior changes between Ringo, Amity, and I all create a remarkably smooth difficulty curve. Ringo only soft drops her Puyos, Amity may make a small 2-chain, and I does not swap pieces and generally avoids going for a Tetris. This was a great design choice, as it ensures that I eventually breaks, while still offering a suitable challenge. You can really see the progression in the Chapter 3 boss. I never back down. After defeating I, we get a few more humorous cutscenes and challenges. So far we've faced the three main protagonists of the Puyo franchise, with our new Tetris protagonist, T, so that's a nice touch. Then on level 8 of Chapter 1, it's finally time to play Puyo, the second main game in the titular Puyo Puyo Tetris. It's a rematch of level 1, except this time you're playing Puyo against Ringo. This is another fairly easy level, 
but it's great that the game eases you into each mode. In fact, the next three levels are all rematches against the various Puyo protagonists with steadily increasing difficulty. Quick note, this overview deliberately contains no spoilers, so that you can still enjoy the surprises yourself. Now, in Chapter 2, the setting shifts away from the Tetris-themed spaceship to the familiar Suzuran city from Puyo Puyo 7. I may or may not have spent a long time learning about all the characters' backstories after getting sucked into this game. It's a rabbit hole for sure, but everyone has so much personality that I immediately got invested in the universe. It helps that, like I said, the game doesn't take itself too seriously. Chapter 2 starts you out with a Tetris match, just to keep your skills sharp, and then transitions into several Puyo levels against familiar characters. Things get spooky halfway through though, as suddenly you're confronted by the best character in the game, Rafina. She's Amity's rival from Puyo Pop Fever, and so it's extra fitting that you have to battle her as Amity. However, there's a twist to this fight. Rafina is your first introduction to the new game mode called Swap, which is easily one of the best parts of the game. In Swap, players must manage two game boards in the same match, one Tetris board and one Puyo board. The game starts by randomly selecting which board you'll start on. Then, after 25 seconds, the game will swap to the other board. While the other match is in progress, the last piece from the previous board will slowly continue to fall. If that last piece were to clear a line or start a chain, then a swap combo will initiate, which deals extra damage to the opposing player. Likewise, if you clear anything at the last moment, that also counts. The game is over when either board hits the ceiling. This is super fun, chaotic, and thematically perfect for a puzzle crossover. It's also surprisingly balanced and competitive. The next two levels are both swap games. One against Feli, if you can see it, and one against Brulu. She's a fitting boss for Chapter 2, which is where the game begins to challenge you. Rafina was a nice introduction, and now Rulu puts up quite a fight. In Chapter 3, things get serious. You've learned how to be bad at Tetris, bad at Puyo, and bad at Swap, so it's time to practice. Accordingly, that's where the plot goes too. In this chapter, they introduce Big Bang, a mode that will destroy your eardrums. There. Stop. Let's do it. Ready? And is also about solving preset board states as quickly as possible. While Big Bang is not that popular of a mode, it's still pretty fun, and good practice for downstacking in Tetris and learning chain patterns in Puyo. The final boss of Chapter 3 is a tremendous difficulty spike, so if you do decide to pick up the game, because it really is one of the best puzzle games out there, at least that I've played recently, then make sure to beware of Lemurus. I do love this boss fight though. It took me many tries to get past him, and I think that this was the first time that I noticed one particularly great gameplay feature. If you happen to get stuck on a specific mission for a long time, the game gives you the option to move on to the next level, just with no stars, obviously. This is extremely valuable for a game like Puyo Puyo Tetris, where every player will inevitably have vastly different sets of strengths and weaknesses. I don't think every game can benefit from this, but one with so many different modes, challenging but well-designed difficulty spikes, and an engaging plot means that this is a welcome feature. Yes, you can skip levels, but you have to fail quite a few times, and the intention is that you will come back to it when you've mastered that mechanic. This is where a game like Puyo Puyo Tetris differentiates itself from, say, Wargroove, another fantastic game with a different design philosophy. I have another retrospective on Wargroove in the video description below if you're interested. The first time that you play Puyo Puyo Tetris, unless you're a natural of these type of games, your goal will inevitably be just to beat the level. They are each a sufficient difficulty spike, and a mix of easy and hard, that you'll enjoy the whole journey. You'll probably skip a few levels along the way, after you get stuck on them and then later on, you'll eventually beat every level. After that, the natural progression is to return for the achievements. What's great about Puyo Puyo Tetris, besides everything, is not only are the three-star requirements varied, transparent, and equally interesting, but they are also not required for anything besides a nice-looking trophy. This is so good because you don't want players to feel bad for getting one star after finally overcoming a boss that was extremely difficult. This can have the opposite effect of stalling player motivation. While I'm all for unlockables that reward player mastery, I think you have to be careful that the achievements for experts don't feel like a wall for new players. One other huge benefit that Puyo Puyo Tetris has with difficulty 
is that the matches are fundamentally quite short, lasting only a few minutes. This means that an individual mistake is not so devastating, since you don't have to repeat any content. You can try a boss as many times as you like, and always come back to it later. Speaking of which, I actually did go back and 3-star every mission, but why did I do that if it doesn't unlock anything? Simply put, the level design was so good that I wanted to do it for fun. The trophy is nice since it's cosmetic, and you don't feel like you're missing out on any actual content just because you're not an expert. I think that's an important distinction. Games can lock a secret mission behind stars as long as the experience on normal difficulty feels complete. This way the extras remain as extras, not gated content behind a steep requirement. I can see it. I know you can't. No. I should have predicted this. We did it, Carly! The three-star requirements in Puyo Puyo Tetris are so satisfying because the levels themselves are fantastically well-designed. Every AI has a different personality, strategy, and requirement. More importantly, there are multiple ways to win, so it never feels like the developers are shoehorning you into a specific way to solve their mission. This is due to the rather amorphous requirements. For example, a level might require a specific point threshold, and these are always interesting. Sometimes this may require a particularly large combo, of which you can build any way you want, or it may even require you to take your time with an otherwise difficult boss that could kill you at any moment. In order to meet the score threshold for Chapter 810, you'll need to make sure that you do not win too quickly while also balancing the need to not die. This is a very satisfying challenge. Conversely, the incredibly difficult boss of Chapter 59, Echolo, has a time requirement that is very low. If you want those three stars, you'll have to play this mission fast and loose, and take advantage of Ekolo's intense need for big risky combos. Note that getting three stars in every mission is not for everyone, and some of these, particularly the examples I just listed, are absolutely brutal to get. I put so much time, blood, sweat, and tears into it, just because I really love the game, and I wanted that achievement, but you'll still get a lot of satisfaction just from simply finishing it. Overall, Puyo Puyo Tetris is an excellent puzzle game. It features an extremely enjoyable single-player campaign, versus mode, and multiplayer that keeps my friends coming over every week just for another round. We all thought nobody would want to play this game after Smash Ultimate came out, and once again, we were wrong. I give Puyo Puyo Tetris my award for one of the most unassuming games in recent years. It's one of the few tens I give a game, and I still can't believe that it's my most played title on the Switch so far. I imagine that I'll be playing this game for quite some time, and my only regret is that Sega doesn't localize enough Puyo games. If you're ever interested in playing a friendly round with me, I do sometimes stream this game on my Twitch channel, and I also play it with my Patreon supporters via Discord. I also have plenty more gameplay of it on YouTube. Puyo Puyo Tetris is great for many reasons, and one of them is certainly that it manages to craft a compelling campaign in a puzzle game. I'm really looking forward to the next localized Puyo game. There are so many other things that it does well too, like the art style, animations, UI, soundtrack, multiplayer, and I could go on for hours, so I'd love to revisit this game and the rest of the Puyo franchise too. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Did you enjoy this overview slash retrospective? Are there any games that you've played recently that you think do a similarly good job with your campaign? I'd also be curious if anyone is interested in more reviews, retrospectives, and game design discussion videos. If you enjoyed watching this video, then feel free to subscribe for more content in a similar style. And I have some other game recommendations at the end, and in the video description below. As always, thank you so much for the support, especially on Patreon. And I look forward to seeing you all in the next video. Thanks for watching.